It's okay. So I changed the output resolution. Um, so I think the downloaded video will be the same, but the streamed video will be half the frame rate and uh, a little bit lower resolution. But I think it's smooth now, and that's really the most important thing. Um, but yeah, no, that it helps that you guys tell me what's what's going on. Anyway, so yeah, right, we're good. Okay, so so we just talked about auth, right? This is how we authenticate, and this is a bit advanced. So I'll make a live stream just for explaining how Go works. But basically you have these things called channels, and channels allow you to send data somewhere and then receive it. So we have a channel that's effectively a for loop that is asynchronously sending data, and it's specifically sending tweets, right? So we have a, a channel sending t tweets through a, a, ch a channel or like a pipe, right? And that's how we, we deal with our stream. So this bit of code is expanding to Oops. It's expanding to uh, 12 lines of code, but don't worry. The point is that we are we are streaming a hashtag for tweets. That's all. And then when we like it or retweet it, we're just calling upon these, right? So we can't we can't like a tweet that we've already favorited because favoriting is the API's. That's how it documents liking a tweet. And we can't retweet a tweet similarly that we've already retweeted. So in both of those cases, it's just fine. Um, then we attempt to retweet. This could fail for whatever reason. Maybe it's our internet, or whatever. And then in that case, we're gonna go ahead and, and leave a warning. So before, we don't need a warning for this because it's sort of harmless. But for here, we're decorating our error with the, screen, the, the, the tweet's username and the actual tweet's context. So that just helps me understand what went wrong, where, so on. This could probably benefit from having a timestamp. Uh, we can do that later, but it's okay for now. Okay, and again, we have the similar sort of logic for following an account. Okay, now really the meat of this, the thing that's sort of exciting to me uh, is this bit of code right here. How do we parse a tweet for whether it's like an authentic tweet or not? So I have a file and it's in this folder called regex. And yeah, this is the infamous regex. Now there's a, there's a way to do this lowercase. I can go ahead and fix that now, but effectively we're looking for things that contain like round one day, 038, right? This would encapsulate that. We're looking for combinations of the letter R, numbers, you know, day, day has its own number. We're looking for things that contain the word around, whether it's uppercase or lowercase, things that include day, whether it includes the word commit or challenge. That's how right now I'm parsing things for whether or not they're authentic. And we compiled the regular expression in advance. And so, so I'm gonna get some slack, flack for this. These are individually regular expressions. What I'm doing is I'm putting all of them in this like mega, monolithic expression that we can use to parse every tweet for this combination. And that's right now how I'm dealing with spammers. I don't want to have a solution where I'm checking for spammers one at a time. What I'd much rather have is, is a general flexible solution that I can apply universally, right? Okay, so one thing that's really cool if you're learning about regular expressions for the first time, there's this website called regex101.com and this will allow you to test regular expressions. So let me show you sort of what the product of this is. Um, let's take this one for example. So here's my regular expression. And it looks sort of insane. I don't know how to parse this if I don't know regular expressions. But there is actually an explanation on the right side and I can just go ahead and test things. So if I say like, I love cocaine, whoops, cocaine, right? There's no match, right? No, no match. But if I say like, day 38, um, blah, 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 right? Like today I learned, you know, uh, regex is ugly, whatever, right? It's because it matched the D38, this tweet would be okay. And believe it or not, that, that like these just few lines of code really keep out so far um, bad actors, which I think is really significant because the, the isn't there a plugin for Sublime that does that in editor? Um, to be honest, maybe, 
I try not to get too attached to the editors that I use because they're editors, um, and I'd rather like learn the, the, the tool or the languages generally speaking. That being said, if it helps you with your development, absolutely. I just personally try not to get too attached to the editor. That's just me. But there absolutely is sort of like a tool for everything if you look for it. Um, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, yeah, so so like right now, let's refactor this, right? I don't want to have two two Ds right here. I'd rather have one D that can be either uppercase or lowercase. So let's let's say I wanted to do like regex lowercase. I'm learning this with you. I don't actually know how to do this. Um, replace. If you guys know, can you comment? Mm -hmm. That's everything. Uh, oh, you know what? Regex case insensitive. That's why. Let's find out together. You should look for the I flag. Case independent, optionally. So this one has the I at the end of it. So like, let's say we had this as an uppercase and a lower K, and then I put D here, D38. Okay, so this is checking optionally for the presence of a hashtag. So in this case, it's not doing anything. But if there were a hashtag right before it, it should check for it. Now, right, it's only highlighting the top line because this is just checking for a lowercase d. And now right over here, I'm checking for slash d is for decimal. I'm checking for a decimal number between zero and nine. And I'm checking for specifically one, two, three of them. There's a suffix for the rigets that tells the engine there. Yeah, I think so too, right? So like, let's try like I, oh. Matches the character, oh, <laughs> it's just checking for the character I. Uh, I think it's more subtle than that. Uh, depends on the implementation, but I would use, okay, let's try this in the engine. Uh, okay, so we put the whole thing like that, right? Oh, that worked. Okay. So we have it working with one of them, but this is a compound regex. So like, let's say, let's say we have these next to each other. Okay, so I've got this and to put them together, I can separate them. Whoops, I can, se am I going crazy? Okay, I can separate them with a, with the pipe, right? So this would be like expression one, expression two, and then it's checking for either one or the other. So like if you're coming from like any programming language, it's effectively like if, this, or that. That's effectively what we're doing with this, with this regex. We're checking it conditionally for the presence of one or the other. So what I do is I have these two expressions and I wrap the whole thing in a parentheses and then I put a pipe in between them. Now I'm checking for the presence of either. Now we know that we don't want this thing. Right, so we know we don't want this thing. Round day, and then can I just put like this guy in front of it? That's great. Holy cow. So this checks for the remainder of the pattern with the following. I modifiers, insensitive. Huh. I've never done that before. <laughs> that code looks like it's so insane. Okay, I think I know what we can do. Okay, so when I'm compiling the expression, each of these percent s's is indicating a part of the monolithic regular expression. So I have this guy, and we can just ignore the beginning, right? So I have expression one, expression two, and there's like six expressions all together. So let's go back. We'll put in the, the round first. So R for round. And did I do that right? No, I didn't. Okay, and then next one is day. 
we're going to cut out the uppercase lowercase and I'm going to put right before it the case insensitive. That's super cool. Yeah, so I can tell Golang, so the question, sorry, uh, someone was saying that I can use uh, Golang's, Golang's implementation. So the thing is, um, yes and no, right? So regular expressions come in flavors, which sounds like super suspicious. Um, there's a JavaScript implementation, there's a Python implementation, and unfortunately, regex, even though it is a standardized utility for how we can parse strings for an expression, <sighs> There are subtleties and inconsistencies about how you would use a regular expression in one programming language from another, which is not ideal, unless it's like adding some feature that other ones don't have, which would be kind of nice. Um, you don't want your regular expression to break from language to language. That's like really brittle. Uh, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's sort of the feeling that you might get that like an app only works on an iPhone and it doesn't work on like an Android device. So you just expect software to work ubiquitously and you don't want to have to sort of hunger, you don't, want, you don't want to have to like have the pain of having to worry about the operating system or the environment that you're using. So it's best when a regular expression can be applied generally uh, because then it's interchangeable. So let's double check. Yeah, so whether I click Golang or PHP or anything, this regular expression is flexible enough that we can use it in any context that we're right that we that we've tested it against so far. Okay, so let's go ahead and and do this. So we're gonna change. Let me save this for later. I'll come back to this. So I'm initializing a global variable called re, which is short for regular expression, and in it we're compiling this monolithic expression. And I know that at the start of it, I want the following expression to be case insensitive. Now we can go in here and sort of tediously clean up the duplicate text, and holy cow, there's a lot of it. I feel like such an idiot. <laughs> uh... By the way, if you're using Sublime, you can do this really cool multi-select by holding Option and Command on a Mac. I'm sure it's something else on a Windows device. Okay, let's check comments. Okay, so we're good. Um, let me know if the video is lagging or whatever. I can optimize it even more. Okay, so... I'm just missing this one. Okay. Now it's looking better. Um, the thing is, these no longer need to be in their own brackets because we can just match the letter. We don't have to match some, like we don't have to match like capital R or lowercase r. We don't have to worry about whether it's open or, we don't, we, basically we're just gonna simplify this. So we'll take this individual expression and I'm gonna just pattern match against anything like this and anything like this. Holy cow, this is, like exponentially more readable. Um, <laughs> we don't even need to like be fancy with like commit and challenge anymore. Now, okay, so you might be wondering why does rounds have a question mark at the end? Um, it's not checking for whether the tweet was a question, it's actually saying this S is optional. So whether they say like round, I don't know, you say like day, you say like day five, or you say like, that'd be grammatically incorrect, but this is more flexible. Anyway, anywhere you have a, a question mark, the character or the expression before it is now optional. Oh, great. Hey, hey. I'm in a bar, by the way. I'm just I'm not I'm just drinking water. I was thinking about ordering like a margarita, just to be funny. Not that that's funny. Okay. Um, Okay, so we're checking for the presence of R, D, round, day, commit, or challenge. Uh, this one can optionally have a hashtag, so I could be like round one if I want it to be like hipster. And then, yeah, this is kind of hard to read. I'm basically checking for round like, like XXX, right? So I'm checking for round and then some combination of up to three numbers. So D is for decimal, and then I'm checking for a combination of one to three uh, 
one to three, zero through nines, right? So another way you could write this would be literally like this, where these two would be optional. So this one is required, and then you have two optional ones. There's The thing is with regex, regex you can write things in like tons of different ways. Um, this is just what I've, I've been using so far. Okay, so anyway, we've refactored our regex and made it like 10 times more readable in the process. So we're going from this expression that I would have totally been embarrassed about, and we're going down to here. So that's like way more manageable and maintainable. When you're programming, the thing is, I think a lot of people go for like speed or efficiency or like whatever. And personally, um, I have a gripe about this. Uh, this is it. it that one, sorry, I'm just answering a question. The how to how I learned to stop worrying and love CSS. That is a talk about front end development. This is a talk about um, how do you make a Twitter bot and how do you deploy a Twitter bot um, and how do you make a Twitter bot that doesn't retweet spammers because it's really easy to abuse the hashtag. Uh, but yeah, this is my second live stream, so welcome. Um, okay, so so cool. We have a case insensitive expression and we're compiling it. And that is our, our regular expression. Okay, so let's go back to our main. And yeah, so, so now let's think about this. The only sort of variables that this program requires is effectively which account we're using and which hashtag we're using. If we think about this as generally as possible, um, we have three Twitter bots. We have 100 days of code with the underscore at the end. We have women who code, the underscore at the bottom, and we have, uh, what was the last one, moms can code, right? Uh-oh. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. Oh. Twitter just crashed on me. Okay, so let's think about this, right? This is the Twitter bot that's up and running. And and the only difference right now that we're gonna, we're gonna deploy is which hashtag our bot is looking for. So whether we're looking for 100 days of code, women who code, or mobs can code, it's literally the same program, which makes the, which, make this, which makes this a, like a really generally flexible bot. So you could use this for like any hashtag in theory and then the only thing that you might want to change is like you don't want to you don't want to parse the tweet for like round or day or challenge or commit. You'd parse it for something else. And again, that's like that's not the most that's not the best solution. Um, there might be some like cool ways to do this with like machine learning and then training a data set. But if you just want to get up to, uh, up and running, I'd say that this is the the minimum expectation you should have, so that you're not wasting people's time. Okay, cool. So I think we're ready to deploy. Do you guys have any questions or, or, or quips or gripes or whatever um, that I should address before we continue? If not, no problem. I'm glad the video is working again. OK, um, I'm going to assume we're good. But let me know. I'll check this every few minutes. OK, so we're going to deploy this thing. Now, the, there's one last thing that we have to sort of talk about real quick. All right, we talked about warnings versus fatal. We talked about the actual program's architecture. We just are streaming a, t a hashtag, and then we interact with it. This is how we deal with spammers and blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, the, the program's super simple. The thing that will change is going to be this file. So I have a file in here. I don't know, I'm squinting my eyes. CD reg. Okay, so I have to be careful here. If I open the wrong file, it exposes the, it's like my password, not my actual password. It's like the, the like encrypted thing. Um, so I have to open the right file here or then anyone could actually take control of this bot. It's really, uh, you have to be careful. Anyway, this is an example of, of what it looks like. Okay. So in it, these are, you can think of these as like environmental, environmental variables. These are the things that any, every, every, sorry, every one of our bot needs to have to be unique, right? 
So these four values correspond to which bot we're using. So like you could just imagine that this whole thing, whoops, this whole thing right here is for like 100 days of code. So that's for this bot. Now over here, the hashtag is which hashtag we want our bot to respond to, right? So we're telling this bot to respond to this hashtag, uh, 100, day, 100, day, 100 days of code. <clears throat> okay, so this is a struct, and in the struct, I'm initializing four types of variables. So I have a hashtag, and then these four things, and then I'm actually filling out the values right here. And the reason I'm doing it like this is so that so that I can do like G for global, so like G is short for global, globals. And then for my global variables, I have hashtag, cons key, cons secret, uh, Sorry, this is short for consumer key, secret, uh, access token, and then access secret. Actually, it's token, secret. That's what these are short for. Sorry, I should have put that there. And I think everything else is self-explanatory. Yeah, so basically we're summoning up this struct um, in our code in a few places. So we're streaming the hashtag that we're getting from our global struct and specifically its hashtag value. We're summoning up the consumer key and the, con the consumer secret when we're initializing Anaconda, which is the, the package that we're using. And we're initializing some extra values uh, when we initialize our account specifically. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to put it online, um, and then we're going to test it. So, okay. What we can do is pretty simple. I'm going to do... Uh, so I'm going to do something called cross compilation. So I'm on a Mac and I want it to, let me, right, let me check for questions, sorry. The token, the token, thank you. Um, when you sign into an account, like on social media, you're used to putting your email address, maybe your name, um, or your username, or your email, it just you're, you're used to putting in two types of information, something that's public and something that's private. So, when you go to apps.twitter.com, it will provide you with these four values. And they're, anal they're analogous to your username and your password, but in a way that Twitter's API can work with. For, I mean, you could design an API that just takes your username and password, but I'm sure there's a reason for it. I don't know what it is, but modern API architectures use these like hashed values to more securely store this information in a way that's more anonymized. Um, you still can't just like paste the stuff on the, in the internet, but it's, a, it's like way more secure than your actual username and password. And one of the nice things is, like let's say I abuse Twitter and I'm like tweeting like crazy. They can revoke um, my, my token, which means I have to ask Twitter to generate a new one. And so that's kind of like their they're like making my, my password defunct and I have to like set up a new password. The point is, um, with Twitter, we have to use their architecture. So we, ha we have to use, uh, let me open it again, CD, the music, CD bars, uh, demo, to be careful here. There are, there are four values that we need no matter what. Our consumer key, and our consumer secret. These are kind of analogous to like, if I'm signing into something like zadik at email.com. That's kind of what these are, right? I'm the consumer and I have a key and a secret. Um, and then I have an access token. Now these can be, um, I can create and get these revoked at any time. So these are more or less actually temporary. If I'm abusing Twitter, they can revoke these, but these still exist. So these are more permanent. These. Um, I need to generate depending on what I'm doing. So I've done this all in advance, um, but the point is it's, it's actually, it's very easy. Go to apps.twitter.com and, and, and go from there. Okay, so that's good. We're gonna go put this online. Okay, so uh, here's what we do. So we're gonna do something called cross compilation. Cross compilation. Now, if you're getting into programming, you know what a compiler is to the extent that you can use it, right? So you're like, well, actually, you might not. It's like, 
Most people use interpreters, um, which interprets your program one, one line at a time. A compiler will compile all lines of your code at the same time. And so when we compile a program, we're taking our, 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 our text, right? Everything I've done so far is just like, it's code, we're turning it into machine code, which means our computer can read it natively, even though we can't. Now, cross-compilation is like a fancier version of this, where the actual machine code, I'm preparing it not for a Mac, but in this case, a Linux, because most servers are Linux-based or Unix-based, I'm gonna compile, even though I'm on a Mac, to a Unix or a Linux-based computer, which is like sort of crazy if you think about it. It's, it's sort of analogous, I'm saying analogous a lot, it's sort of analogous to like Google Translate, right? So instead of me needing to know some language, I can speak into my phone and then it can cross, not compile, but sort of cross translate to another language, even though I don't have knowledge of this other language. So that's what cross compilation is for. Um, so I have a shortcut to basically tell the computer that I want to cross compile. So I'm basically saying, I want to compile to a Unix or a Linux-based system. This is a, a function that I made. Um, it's pretty simple. But the point is, we need to tell the computer that, hey, whatever we're about to compile, our computer is not the target anymore. It's some other architecture. And then we can go put in our command, which I'll do now. I'm just going to check for questions. OK, cool, we're good. OK, so I need to compile a couple of files. So what we're going to do. Uh, bot3 is the current iteration. And then in my, whoops, in my vars folder, I have a few different ones. So we're gonna deploy woman who code first. So I'm gonna do underscore woman who code. Okay, so this will give us the, 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 um, the consumer secret, the consumer token. This is gonna give us that, that thing that's similar to our username and our password. So we're compiling not just for a Unix computer, we're compiling women who code for a Unix-based computer. Okay, now we need to put in our regular expression. Okay, so I'm basically combining these three separate files and putting them together. Um, this is effectively concatenating one giant main. So I'm not using like other packages beside the standard library in Anaconda, I'm just using package main and my dependencies, just for simplicity. Now when I output this, um, just to be sort of explicit, I'm going to say output to a file called bot3. So, right, I can make the, actually that's a bad idea. Let's do like woman who code. So our binary will be called woman who code. O dash O is for output. And I'm outputting it to literally the string. So the binary will be called woman who code. We're going to compile these three files into one file. And we've already told our computer that we want to do this for a, a Linux or Unix based system. Okay, named files must all be in one directory. Um, I did not know that. So let's move regex uh, to here, and then let's rename, let's do this. Regex, and then move. So I'm basically just fixing the folder structure, and then I'm just gonna change it to regex.go, because there's only one. And then let's go to cdvars. Let's take all this stuff and move it out. Um, okay, cool. So just do like move vars star here. Move our far. Am I gonna screw something up? No, I'm not. Okay. Okay. The token you're creating an executable with a Go extension. Isn't that confusing? I'm actually not doing that. Um, let me show you. I'm sorry if that was confusing. Okay. Let's go back to our command. So let's break this down. Um, Thank you for asking questions because if other people watch this, I mean, I don't want to like lose them just because I like didn't explain something well. So, I mean, it helps a lot. So we're call let me like put this in brackets. Um, there is this amazing website called explainshell.com. If you've never seen this website, it's going to be bliss for you. So like, let's say I said like echo, hello world, right, explainshell.com. Okay, if I say hello world, this will parse that and show me what I'm doing semantically. So I'm saying call the echo command, and then with that echo command, call, uh, use hello world as its parameter or its argument, right? So let me do this sort of similar thing it's doing right here for you. 
So our, our command, you can think of this as like our verb. We're calling the command go build. Then I'm using a option. This is optional, right? I'm, I'm, I'm saying I want the output of this to just be literally a file called WHC for women who code. There, it's not actually a Go file anymore. This is a this is assembly. Is it? A, I think it's it's a machine. It's machine code um, for a Linux architecture. And then the file inputs are these three files. So we're we're taking like three plates of food, we're like putting it on one plate of food. We're cooking it, and then that 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 like cooked plate. It's like a terrible analogy. Is women who code. Um, let me make sure that made sense. Yeah. All right, so we didn't get an error message. And if I check ls, we have a new file called Women Who Code. Let's just open it up. Right? Um, this is just plain machine code, but it's not machine code that this computer even understands. If I do dot slash women who code, that's how I execute this program. It's broken. But I can show you under the hood, the code that we had just written that I showed you and compiled, this is the output. This is meaningless to a human, but to a computer, this is all it needs to know. <laughs> This is 400 lines of machine code. This is how our program is actually working behind the hood. So, so think about that. People used to actually write programs by like scribbling in values in this way, and then nowadays we can just like type human semantically readable code, share it over the internet. We have open source websites. I mean, it's a relatively new field, um, but there's been a lot of advancements in terms of how much more practical and easy and effective programming is now. Cool. All right, so we have this executable. It's on our machine. So what we can do is, let's go to uh, Digital Ocean. Okay, I've done this in advance, but I want to just walk over it so you're not too intimidated. Oops. So you're not too intimidated. Okay, cool. So DigitalOcean is a website that we can use, and what they do is spin up an instance of a, a Linux computer. So it's usually a virtual instance. So it's not like, they're not like turning on a computer for us, it's just using software to create a virtual instance of, of Linux. All right, here's my email. So we're logging in, and I've created an instance, or what they call a droplet. And this is basically, uh, where we're sending our code over the internet. So I have to have internet for this step. Everything else so far, I don't technically need internet, but I do need internet for this. So I have this one instance right here, and now we're gonna go and connect to it. This music is amazing. So we do, uh, this is one way you can do it. SCP is a command that is generally available, and this allows you to send files from one computer to another. Um, there's some other stuff you have to do to get the to, to set up DigitalOcean, but this is how you would proceed once you're you're ready. So we're gonna send this file, right? So SCP here to some computers. We'll say like root, and then like here. Let me let me show you. So like let's say I have a, like a Linux computer, and it has an account called Zadek on it, or it has an account called Who Women Who Code on it. This goes before the at, and then after goes the IP address. And then I need to put this colon at the end because this is actually where on the, the, the computer I'm putting the file. So if I'm like putting it in like some folders, I can like do that too, but I'm just putting it at the top. Now I'm lazy, so I only have a root, <laughs> a root account on this computer, and then I've saved it into a function that I can just call upon. So... Let's try this. All right, and oops, almost forgot. Okay, let's see what happens. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we're gonna open it up, so this function that will open up our, our server. Okay, I'm in the server, right? Let's check for questions, cool. We're in the server, we're ready to deploy, deploy our bot. Now, you'll note that I've got some other things in here already. So this is literally, uh, 
This is um, 100 days of code. This is the executable. It's just like women who code. And I have it writing to two files, standard error and standard output. So if the, if the, if the bot is like leaving warning messages or whatever, I have a trace for me to review. So this is really how simple it is now for us to deploy. This is me deploying the bot. We just do dot slash women who code and it doesn't take any arguments. Now, in the event that it's going to error or like leave a message, I want to capture it. This is one way to do it. My standard out output is one and then uh, bracket. We're going to say like, we'll do like standard output. So standard output is good. This is like good messages. This is something's working. If we, if we have a, a message that something is working, we want to put it in a file called standard output and I'll append it with woman who code. Now if there's an error, we do two, uh, what is it called, bracket? No, sorry, it's an arrow. I don't know, my brain is like a little numb right now. Uh, standard error, woman who code. Now I want to run this in the background, so I can just put this little ampersand and in theory, our bot is live. So I'm gonna check if there was any immediate error. No? Okay. I'm going to pretend I'm a woman now and, and check the success of this. Okay. Um, let's do another test. So do you like, uh, should I like, woman who code, um, like, I love cocaine. All right, so this should not work because, um, because it's not gonna match a regular expression. So nothing should happen, basically. It's like a void of darkness. Cool, <laughs> I just look like an idiot. Let me delete that. Okay, we're gonna try it again, but now we're gonna do, uh, let's do like, day, Day one, I learned something cool. And then we do women who code. I don't know if this is gonna work. I'm gonna find out. That's amazing. So you see, if we click it, it was immediately liked and immediately retweeted. And if I open up women who code, there it is. Now. I mean, obviously you don't want to spam this, um, but the point is that we have a generally flexible, we have generally flexible code, we just change a few parameters, send it to our server, and, and that's how we, we ship this by. And in theory, unless we like wrote some really bad code, it's just up and running. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, there's another command called disown, which honestly, I don't know what it does, but it's supposed to like make this program continue running in the background? I don't know. Uh, but the point is, this one is done. So now, all we need to do is compile uh, mom's can code, right? So we're just changing a file and we deploy it like anything else. Okay, so let's do uh, go build output. Uh, we call this um, uh, mom's can code. And then our input is bot3. We have the vars for moms can code, and then we have the regular expression. I think that's it. And then let me make sure. Okay, so now we're cross compiling. Put this in. Okay, it's easy. Uh, moms can code, and then let's do root at go server one. Yeah. Hmm. Nothing's happening. Am I online right now? Yeah, I'm online. What's going on? This is creepy. Sorry. Uh SP root good server one. Hmm, it's so weird. Let's check the error. It's not erroring. Okay, let's try it again. Um, 
Mom's skin code. This. Let's try this again. Okay. CD source, and then we do. Let's do go distro, and then go build. Mom's can code bot three. Mom's can code regex. Okay. SCP Mom's can code uh, root at go server one. No. Oh, it's not. It's go droplet. Sorry. So it was like logging into the server in the background and we didn't see it because there was no output. Okay, so now we can go into the server with go server one. And just like before, we just do dot slash, uh, do dot slash MCC for moms can code. And then we're gonna do standard output. So STD out, and then we'll do moms can code. Standard error would be standard Error, moms can, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. So, yeah. Okay, and then we want to run it in the background. Okay. Disown. Okay, let's check it out. You guys are welcome to use it, just please don't <laughs> abuse it. Um, okay, let's do, uh, let's do like day one, moms can code. Let's check it. That's so cool. So the, the thing is like, <clears throat> most Twitter bots suck. Um, they take like 30 plus minutes. Um, they retweet spammers and they like generally make Twitter like a, like a worse place. Worse sir, worse, more worse. So the, this is just some ideas for you know, how to make a Twitter bot, how to do it in a way that's a bit more respectful in terms of what it's retweeting, and to do it in a way where, um, to do it where it's retweeting, and to do it in a way that is instant, so people get instant gratification when they're working on this stuff. So let's go ahead and check the bots that we made and see how they're doing. Uh, women who code, okay. Check this out. We're already retweeting people. So four minutes ago. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if it should have. Yeah, so we have to like, it gets tricky. Um, why, is, why is it parsing this regex? Hard day. I'll have to check. But yeah, it's already working. It's already online. Uh, I don't think Mom's Can Code is being used yet. But it's not that hard to do this this stuff if you have any knowledge of programming. So yeah, um, I'll put the code on GitHub or something, and then put the put it in the description so you can use it or whatever. But yeah, um, do you guys have any questions before we we finish this up? I have to, oh, that's so funny. There's a time delay, so I have to like wait 10 seconds for you to hear that I asked you if there's questions. It's like when you're like in space, you know, you have like a 30 minute time delay to Houston. Oh, cool. Great. Um, thanks, guys. So I'll post this to YouTube, let everyone know. Start using Women Can Code, Women Who, women who Code, and Moms Can Code appropriately. And, and yeah, so cool. All right, thanks guys, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you, I've never done this stuff before, so it's really nice to have a, an audience, albeit if it's small. All right, see ya.